let's do this. This is going to be a good day. All right. I have, I have really done something that uh, marketers and advertisers for certain movies have done over the last 10 years, which is I hyped up the thing itself quite a bit uh, when it comes to movies. This is our first 20th century work. This is our first work of true modernism. And this is our first work where the author has witnessed something that had never happened in the history of the world ever before. In 1914 and 1918, the first ever worldwide war occurred. Uh, sometimes called the Great War in olden times, but now known because of it uh, happened again just uh, 20, 25 years later, um, World War I. It's a shocking event, very uh, interesting economic time uh, in the uh, 1900s and 1910s leading up to World War I. I'm, I'm not going to get really into the details. There are so very many details, and I highly recommend you take World War I. World War II sort of history course here, if you're extraordinarily interested in these uh, very unique happenings in the world. But um, you should know that one thing that thinkers thought at the time and expressed in their writing was that there was so much economic interdependence between European nations that there would never be another war. That was something that was said. That is something that is currently said, by the way. And yet we see wars especially over the last five years, breaking out everywhere. Ukraine, Lebanon, and Israel, Israel and the Palestinians as well. Uh, and so uh, that you might consider that an argument against such a theory. But why I mention that is we went from theorizing, we, we scholars, uh, went from theorizing that war would never, ever happen again to experiencing the largest war that had ever happened in time and the most destructive and uh, with a, a vast, vast number of deaths. And so this text itself is set in 1904. It's actually set on the date that uh, James Joyce met his future wife, Nora Barnett, the great man. Uh, Balloon's Day is a great day, by the way, June 16th. You now, as literary individuals, must maintain that that is, in fact, a holiday. It is Balloon's Day. There are typical ways to celebrate it, to go on your own Irish junket, to have a Guinness or something like that. But I, I think enjoy the day. Know that that is the day on which this text takes place. The entirety of this text, all of you listens, all 18 chapters of it, thank you, takes place during the course of one day. So kind of weird that it's called Ulysses based on the, the Odyssey because we know one major thing. Most people know one major thing about the Odyssey, which is that it was, it's based on a very long journey. Did any of you know how long Odysseus was at sea after the Trojan War? 10 years. Do you know how long the Trojan War lasted? 10 years. So how long was Odysseus away from his home? 20 years. It's the entire life of his son. It's like he didn't even have a son. So when he meets his son, his son is 20 or 21. And I'm going to make a lot of connections like this because I am someone who studies the Odyssey and also Ulysses. And so I'm just as happy to live in the classical past to come into the modern, postmodern, post postmodern present. But one thing I will say about the figure potentially of Ulysses, this character, one Leopold Bloom, so these are the sorts of connections that are very difficult to see without the, the Odyssey in your back and without having read this text many times. Odysseus has lived the last 20 years as if he does not have a son. Leopold Bloom has lived the last 10 years because his son died. So he has lived also as if he does not have a son, but without the simile, right? Simile is the great killer of meaning, as if. Not, he has not lived as if he, uh, let's make it plural, no son. He has lived without a son. And so, even not an, analog, not an analogous experience, but the experience itself, something deeper to that. It's like saying, if I say to you, it was like being in fire. I'm suggesting that I was burning. Am I saying I was burning actually as much as if I were burning in fire? 
Probably not, because that's the archetypal situation by which uh, uh, that I use to describe the experience of burning, right? Or it's like, I wish I had died. You didn't die. That's apparently the most mortal thing that can, mortal, right? Mortis, die, mors mortis, uh, from Latin, to die. Um, and yet, and so we, we use these archetypal situations as, as sort of divots in the ground to root our interpretations of what happened. To us, so like say, when you say you're starving, for example, you don't think you're starving, but you do know that you're hungrier than usual. And so you compare your greater hunger than usual to the, the greatest case of being not hungry, which is to experience uh, famine or starvation. And so there will be many, many, many as if connections in this text. And that itself ties very clearly into the modernism in this course where we experience representation and reality and really parse the relationship between representation and reality, and even representation of representation. What do I mean by that? I mean, when a book features another book, or a piece, or a book features a play within it, or like a play within a play, like in Hamlet, for example. How does art represent art? How does representation represent representation? How does mimesis, the most uh, sophisticated word for representation from the Greek, from which we get mime and mimetic, how does mimesis Mimic, my nieces, there you go. I hope you're using some of the terms and concepts from this course to win some arguments with your friends, by the way. I was told that in one of my courses last semester by a, a very jovial pre law student. Uh, he, he, I'm, I'm crushing all my friends in the basement. He said, I, I would hope you do. I would hope that you do. All right, that's my general introduction to this text. Let's talk a little bit about James Joyce. Um, there's so much to say about him, but one thing I, I will say about him is that he is a true modernist. The true modernist existed basically in the time between the First World War and the rise of the National Socialists in Germany. Those are called the Nazis. Um, and it took them a long time, by the way. I, I believe uh, I might be a year off of this, but uh, Hitler was elected in something like 1933. And it wasn't until um, the 1940s, 1941, that World War II started. And so a lot happens over the time. But between World War I and World War II, there was a, a huge bout of existential angst. And this is for reasons that we've mentioned. There was a coming of secularism and a reduction of religion's place in people's lives. And religion is very important to people historically because it gives them a reason to live and certain habits and customs to, uh, to embody while they are alive. It gives them a, a board, and uh, it's like a board game, a board and spaces on which to uh, move on the board and a die to throw in order to know how many spaces to move forward. It gives one's like structure. The structures of existence have been changing rapidly uh, with the coming of the 20th century. So rapidly that not only have we seen a scientific revolution and an industrial revolution uh, a split between um, Protestants and Christians, and the coming of the printing press and the proliferation of the fictionalized word. Not, not only are there now so, some classical epics with their ethical frameworks and some major religious works, but chivalric romances and all sorts of fiction that might uh, that may not serve the same role as religious texts for informing and structuring people's lives. Within the largest war ever to have existed happened. This is a time of fractionation. People are schizophrenic in a way. They do not know what is up or what is down. Things have begun happening in the world that are unthinkable and that have been traditionally unthinkable to people. Flight has started to occur, which one of the thinkers I'm going to mention to you today, Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psycho, uh, psych he would call himself an analytical psychologist. Some people call him a psychoanalyst, uh, subsuming him to Freud. They thought they were independent of each other. Uh, but Jung thought that plane flight was a delusion that humans projected into the sky that showed our own hyperborean and inflated sense of ourselves. Can we fly now? We've gone to the moon. We've gone to the moon. Uh, we're thinking about going to Mars. Think about terraforming Mars by this point. Uh, these may be delusions of ours, but we've really uh, made a lot of traction. And so uh, certain 
certain thoughts that were considered totally impossible have come to be come to be during the lives of the people that uh, produce these theories. There will be no more war. There can never be flight. Things like these. Very interesting. Um, one that uh, one that I don't think I'm going to see is that when I was growing up, people thought we were going to have flying cars, but instead we produced the internet, which probably more important, right? The internet practically instantaneous information transmission. It's like teleporting information across the world to somebody. Uh, to me, that's more important than teleporting me across the world. And in fact, we do have Zoom too, as we know from Cody. Okay, um, call that the second introduction. Let's get to the straight introduction itself. The life and times of James Joyce. He was born February 2nd, 1882. He entered Klongawe's Wood College, prestigious Jesuit boarding school, something about the English they call their high schools colleges often. Um, so if you're ever confused, you're like, why is this 13-year-old at college, high school? Um, it's a prestigious boarding school convention from the English. 1898, he entered University College Dublin, learns French, Italian, German, Latin, not Greek, by the way. He talks with his... Uh, uh, <laughs> His roommate, Buck Mulligan, uh, about Greek. Apparently, Buck Mulligan has learned some Greek. But this is something that you will see over and over again in the pages of Ulysses. Joyce includes his learning. He will include Italian dialogues uh, between Stephen Dedalus and his Italian tutor, who te is teaching him to sing. Uh, of course, one of the same uh, songs that Molly Bloom will be singing under the care of Boy, uh, under the management of Blaise Boylan is La Cheetah Rem Damano, which is a song from Don Giovanni, um, and is in Italian. French is constantly mentioned. Stephen Dedalus himself is a character who has just come back from France because his mother was dying and has now died. It's a major tragedy in his life, by the way, um, that he thinks about all day whenever death comes up, even looking at a dead dog, comes back to his mother. Um, this is how, this is, you might hypothesize that this is how humans think, associating um, rather than causing. That's perhaps how scientists are taught to think, but naturally, human clusters of things. Uh, you are like this. You are as if you are that. And I would say that the art of teaching is the art of making relevant connections. The end of the um, in any case, um, he graduates in 1902 and initially intends to pursue medicine, very typical sort of course of study. At, at that time, you may know that in the late 19th century, there were really only three courses of study for a person to uh, in college, study so theology, a priest, study um, law, become a lawyer, study medicine, and become a doctor. It wasn't really until the early 20th century that colleges started to develop uh, new faculties. In fact, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who you may have heard of, and C.S. Lewis, was themselves uh, some of the first faculty members of the English department at Oxford. Um, so the fact that he wanted to study medicine doesn't necessarily mean that he was a universal genius who was good at medicine, good at the arts, he was extraordinarily, extraordinarily brilliant. I don't wish to take this away from him, but at the time in which he was being educated, there were only so many paths that one could go uh, in college. Now you look at agricultural mechanical colleges like this, and look at the number of professions that you can study. I mean, every day I walk uh, to this regal building, teach literature, I walk by fan modes. I mean, there are practical professions that one can learn about now at a uh, at colleges. And, and something you should know about the nature of, say, this college as an agricultural and mechanical one is that it was first born to service a different population from the ones, uh, the Ivy League schools that were the first schools in this country. Uh, they, they were first produced to produce preachers, uh, lawyers, and physicians. And now we produce all sorts of types of uh, people and service all sorts of populations as well. And this is something you can really, really think about. You're like, why, why might we have an agricultural and mechanical college? in Baton Rouge. Why might they have an agricultural and man mechanical college in Texas, for example? Think about the geography, and uh, well, perhaps it will make a uh, great sense. In any case, uh, some of us do teach literature down here, too. 1903, right after his education. This is not Stephen Daedalus. This is James Joyce, but there are many similarities between them. In fact, uh, many commentators suggest that Stephen Daedalus is himself the young James Joyce. Um, and James, and I'll, I'll tell you this, it's very sad, and this is the, each character in this text that we focus on, there are three major ones, has experienced a major tragedy that they carry with them 
every day of their lives. And part of what this text seeks to show to you is that every day of your life is connected. And the things that have happened to you, the things that you want, stay with you. And you think about them and you remember them all day, every day. So if you've experienced some tragedy, there are going to be things around you that remind you of it constantly. And so another hypothesis for you is to wonder as you read this, is this how a human life is spent? I mean, even in chapter three, when Stephen's brilliant mind is put on display for us without the interruptions of his young students, we see, we, he has this one thought of, am I walking into eternity? as I walk down Sandy Mount Strand. This is it's in Kimono Beach in Dublin. Think about this. Are you walking into eternity as you walk down Government Street here? And yet, with Stephen Dedalus, he is. His book is still around 100 years later. As he is narrated movie, he is entering eternity. Because he, so far, uh, ex parte ante, that means eternity from a beginning that never ends, rather than eternity that has no beginning or ending, he will exist for all time. At least so far he has, perhaps he won't. But is there something eternal and universal, even in a subjective and perspective bound universe? Is it not that we can't see the universal because of our limited human, subjective, individual perspectives, but that we more like carrots in a diamond or colors on a spectrum can only see bits and pieces of that which is universal or eternal at a time. This is a major question. Because of our split and fractionated perception, can you not see universal concepts or truth? Is that denied to you entirely? Or is it just extraordinarily difficult to put the pieces together, even when you see them, you do not know where they go, like the beginning of a jigsaw puzzle. Where do you put that one piece that you just picked up, right? You don't know. You don't have any concept of where it should go. You know it's got to go somewhere because of how the nature of a jigsaw puzzle. But until you started putting the picture together a little bit, it's hard to see where anything goes. Right? Huh. Huh. Okay. Okay. So 1903. Joyce returns home to Ireland from France after learning by telegram his mother has cancer. This is a huge event for him. He uh, he loves him. And um, the character based on him, Stephen Dedalus, himself very much an Irish Catholic, comes from an Irish Catholic family. What do I mean by that? What do you think I mean by that? He comes from very much an Irish Catholic family. Means comes from a very large family. His father, father Simon Dedalus, um, with his mother, I think he has, I always get this number wrong, because one hears it, I think, once in, the, in Ulysses, but it's easy to look up. So, uh, Stephen has something like 12 siblings. Yes, right, right. He comes from a large family. Stephen is the eldest. Stephen is the most gifted. It costs money to send the child to prep school at this time. It costs money to send them to college a lot. You only send the children who are really, really, really good at this time. And this will come up in this text. People see Stephen as extraordinary because he has a college. It's more like having a PhD at his time. Most people are not educated like he is. And his other siblings who are younger than him, he's only 21. How old are they? All much, much younger. I've now lost their mother. And their father is, like many of the figures that we will see in this text, not somebody that is looking to take a ton of responsibility. So Stephen's family is in a terrible place. Dad, you'll see him, Simon, running around all day. You'll see one of his daughters actually come up to him and beg him for money, beg her own father for money, and he'll claim he doesn't have any until he gives her some. Um, and then he'll use the money that he had saved from that later to have a drink. Um, only a half drink, though, because he doesn't have much. And so, Stephen, 
I'm talking about Joyce, but I, I'm using using Stephen as a as a lens. When Stephen was called back to see his mother, he thinks about this over and over and over in the first three chapters, and this will come up over and over again in the text, even the Hades chapter, or excuse me, even in uh, chapter 15, which I'm trying to call Hades, perhaps it is called Hades. I'll have to look at that. It, it has something to do with the dead. Um, it is Circe, excuse me, because Hades, of course, is chapter six. Um, Stephen, and this is brought up by Buck Mulligan in chapter one, and uh, he says that his aunt won't let him hang out with Stephen Dedalus, his cousin, uh, because there's something, uh, not, the word is, is important, but I don't have it with me. There's something nefarious. There's something wrong with Stephen. What, why, why do people think that there's something a little off with him? Well, he's just come back from his Jesuit education, his Catholic education, full of doubts. They wanted him, the Jesuits, to become a Jesuit because of his profound skills. And yet, he wants to be a writer. He wants to relate. This comes from uh, the, the prequel to Ulysses called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. He wants to create the un or write the uncreated conscience of his people. He wants to be a writer. He wants to create for himself, not repeat that which has been said. Um, but again, when he returns to his mother, this is Stephen, not Joyce, the turning up of the drama for the fiction. His mother asks him to sing Love's Old Sweet Song to her, um, which is one of the songs that Molly Bloom will be singing alongside La Chine de Rennes. comes up over and over again. We'll hear uh, bits of it too throughout Ulysses' it's a sad song. Um, but she also asks him to pray over her. Now, Stephen has a tremendous amount of integrity, and artistic integrity, and philosophical integrity. And also great love for his mother. His mother is dying. What would most people choose to do in such a moment, even if they were atheists? Pray. Say, it's not that big a deal. Don't worry about it. You know, even believe in your heart, but speak with your mouth something, you know, uh, something like that. Stephen doesn't do it. He refuses to pray for his mother. His mother's dying. Of course, I really think about this. Someone who's responsible for treating him like he's valuable. He thinks about this in chapter two when he deals with uh, Cyril Sargent. He's like, he has weak eyes, like I have weak eyes. A face only a mother could love. Perhaps that was me. And his mother is responsible for everything. Loved him, sent him letters, and encouraged him when he was off at school and was lonely, which is something that hadn't gone very far away from home. Uh, for my own education, it does get lonely when you're not surrounded by everything that you know people, friends, family, uh, you know, your home, uh, everything that makes a home a home. And so Stephen refuses. Why does he refuse? Not because he hates his mother, he loves his mother. He can't stop thinking about his mother during the course of this day. He can't stop torturing himself for what he did. Because in his heart, there is a division. Can he be the man he wants to be? if he is willing to sacrifice his ideals in powerful moments like these. In his own mind, he thinks no. That's why he made the decision that he did. A decision that he lives with every day of his life that causes him pain, that even makes him an outcast among those who know him because they know what he did. Buck Mulligan holds it against him, brings it up within the first 15 minutes of Stephen Daedalus' day. And so... <laughs> Even when he gets drunk, he will envision his mother, and she will she will show up in an even as an even stronger presence. This is one reason uh, not to do drugs when you're in a bad emotional state, because it is in fact your mind that keeps your mind off of these things. The less you have your restrainer up here, more everything just flows in. And so, uh, this is something we actually know about the brain. By the way, when you remove parts of the brain from, say, a cat, they become hyper exploratory. The reason you're not always just looking around all interested in things is because of your brain. It's not your brain that makes you super interested. It's your brain focuses. And you should think about what your brain does as you 
move through life and become even more focused. It's like it really turns you into what you are. There's no faith in that. That's something I can't express to young people very well. But one does become what one does. There's no other, no other way. And so James Joyce himself did return to his mother. He did not deny her up there at the end of life. Stephen David was dead. It's something he's going to think. The other major character, Leopold Bloom, what will he think about all day? He's got a lot to think about. Uh, he's dead son Rudy. He blames himself. We hear about this when he's sitting at the church. He um, says that the baby is healthy because the woman is unhealthy because the man. He's a little Jewish belief, by the way. He is ethnically a Jewish individual. His father, Virag, had been Jewish, but converted to um, Catholicism to marry, or excuse me, Protestantism in order to marry. Um, uh, Leopold Bloom's mother. And then Leopold Bloom himself was a Protestant who then converted to Catholicism so that he could marry his wife, Molly. Bloom has never forgotten the fact that his son died and has never stopped blaming himself. There is a major indication in the text that shows us this. Do you know what it is? There's something that he and Molly have not shared since their son died. It's a sort of psychoanalytic Freudian type. They have not copulated. They have not laid together as man and woman. They have not known each other in a biblical sense. They have not had sex. Okay. Okay, I sort of understand that, right? Because, because Bloom feels responsible for what happened to his son, he feels kind of like a murderer, if he were to lay with his wife again and she got pregnant and they had another son, what might happen again? Maybe death again. This is something that a lot of people that experience miscarriages or the death of young children go through. They make a choice never to have another child. It's too much for them. It hurts too much to lose a child. Um, that said, that's not the only option you could have or will take in the future. But something you should know about Molly. This is a very, very uh, risky thing to portray in a 1922 uh, work. So she's a highly sexual being. She, uh, one of the sort of crude and rude stories that Leopold Bloom remembers is that she saw two dogs in heat at one point and then herself became aroused and, uh, and started speaking to Leopold Bloom. He thinks a lot during the course of his day, not only about Rudy, but also about his wife in the younger days with his wife, the days with his wife when the their relationship was untarnished, was freer, and they could enjoy themselves without the baggage of having lost a child. I mean, there are many divorces of a child, um, but there's something else that Bloom cares. This day, Bloom said, Molly's manager, Blaise Boylan, who is a cock of the walk, he dresses, I would say, very similar to how I dress, but with a straw hat and a beard. And he's a dashing fellow. He's much more dashing than I am. He's a business guy. And he's, he's rich. He walks around jingling change in his pocket. And even when he buys something from a young girl, he sees that she has roses. He goes, is this for me? She just smiles at him. He knows. He's a Don Giovanni sort of character. Well, Molly is extremely beautiful. And most of the men around town do not understand why she ended up with Leopold Bloom. We'll talk a lot about that in the future. She's a self of Spanish blood. She's a little darker looking than the, the local Irish around there. And she also has a little bit of Jewish blood in her too. Uh, um, actually through her mother, which is, uh, so she has more of the matrilineal descent, which is, um, which is the traditional way that Judaism ethnically is, is passed down, matrilineal rather than patrilineal. So technically she's actually more ethnically Jewish than Bloom. That said, Bloom is very much seen as Jewish and in a very Catholic and anti-Semitic time um, in Ireland. And we see this even as soon as uh, chapter two, when Mr. Deasy, uh, the, the Nestorian figure, or the, the Nestor-like figure, Nestorianism is a such Christianity, um, uh, when he uh, runs out at the end of the chapter to finish a joke that he tells to Stephen Dallas who's working for him as a teacher, and he's like, why did Ireland never kick out? This is a rude joke, by the way, but this is his joke. Why did Ireland never kick out the Jews? Because they never let them in. So, of course, not true. We have Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom there, too. And, but this is 
This is the sort of joke that is told openly at this time to show the attitudes of the individuals. And this is how people see Bloom. They see Bloom as an outsider. Why did this outsider get the most beautiful woman? But I tie this back to Blaze's boy. This beautiful Molly, sexual being who's been denied the company of her husband for 10 years, has had enough. And on this day, she receives a piece of post, a letter, a letter that is addressed to Mrs. Marion Bloom. You're not all grimacing. You must not know an old convention. Do you know how one addresses the Christian wife of a Christian individual, traditionally speaking? Wait, wait, so with the last thing, that's a good idea. What is another idea? With the husband's first name. That's right. Being absorbed into the husband's family, the traditional idea is that one absorbs the husband's name, not only the last name, but even the first name uh, when it comes to being. And this convention is still maintained at times by certain organizations when they address toast. Not most of them at this point, but yes, if one were being respectful at this time, it would be to Mrs. Leopold. Bloom. You're like, that seems like kind of subtle. I'm like, okay, say you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a day friend or whatever. And one of their friends says, hey, baby. Right. You would have a reaction if you saw that text. You would know from how the person, from how your person, the person with whom you have a very specific relationship that's sort of contracted, right? There are certain things you don't do when you're in a relationship. People seem to act as if you have broken a contract if you do certain things. But if somebody else were to say, use a term like that of affection, close romantic affection, the person you are in a soul relationship with, that would make you, you know, raise your eyebrow and say, well, what is the nature of this relationship between the two of you? I immediately trust would start to fall away. Blazy Boylan wrote this letter. Uh, Molly hides it, too. Hides it under her pillow. Bloom sees her hide it. Who sent you that? Who sent you that letter? He asks. Oh, Blazes Boylan. It's like hearing Fabio, Hercules, or Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime sent your wife a letter. A letter. It's like, ah, that's the playboy who walks around. Oh my goodness, it is clear to Bloom at the very outset of his day that his wife, that Blazes Boylan has designs on his wife, sorts of designs, sexual designs. He knows all day long that, I'm going to get this time a little bit wrong because I, I don't have it in my memory. I think it's 4 p.m. It could be 5 p.m. I'll, I'll get into this in the next lecture. He knows exactly what time. Blazes Boylan is going to go see his wife. So he knows exactly at what time he is going to cheat her. And he knows this all day long, going throughout his day. And he'll even see Blazes Boylan right before it happens. They'll be in the same place. He'll see Blazes Boylan leave. Take nothing. Why is he doing that? This is something that I really want you to ponder, but characters in this text carry heavy weights. Leopold Bloom is 38. Stephen Dedalus is 21 or 22. They hold differing weights based on their differing places in the world and their differing times in the world, or rather their differing ages. Uh, Stephen has only witnessed so much that can be tragic at this point. Bloom has a little bit more that he has to deal with. Um, and, well, uh, I really want you to uh, take that home with you. And, and as you read this uh, insanity-inducing book, really think about, am I like Stephen? Maybe you're very different from Stephen. You're probably very different from Stephen. Um, uh, Stephen's a genius. Fine. He might be a genius. But um, when you're teaching, or so when he's teaching, he's thinking about Homer. He's thinking about thoughts of Aristotle, uh, Spanish Jews, Spanish Muslims, like Verwees and Maimonides, thinking about Aristotle's metaphysical concept of God, thought, thinking thought, thought as the thought of thought, and he's thinking all of this between asking questions to his students. A lot of times, students are taught that Stephen is a genius, and they're like, 
I get he's smart, but I don't know why he's smart. It's because of the quality of thoughts that he has while he's thinking that we have access to. These are highly philosophical thoughts. They come from highly philosophical and highly theological, very difficult texts. He's just thinking about these things all day long. I mean, can, can you imagine that while I'm giving this lecture, I'm also thinking about abstract philosophy in between my questions? It's like, it's not happening. But for him, and, and then we get to see him on a walk in chapter three, just in his head. And that's when you really get to see. Bloom is extremely smart. Bloom is extremely practically intelligent. He's an advertising man, so he's a little bit creative, very practical, got some business to him. He uh, he knows what the word metapsychosis means, which is why Molly asks him about it. He says, it's the transmigration of the soul. She says, oh, rocks, Paul, do you tell me in plain English? And um, she's not as educated as he is, apparently. She likes dime store romance novels. Um, he will pick her up a new one. And he says, um, it means reincarnation. Like, um, when... Uh, the soul, after one body dies, finds a, a new body. And, um, well, that, that word so important to this course uh, that we see not only in this text, but also in our, our next text. Perhaps it is the case that our bloom is himself a, a metempsychotic transmigration, transmigrational uh, reincarnation of the figure of Odysseus. Odysseus. Perhaps Stephen is a reincarnation of the sun of Ulysses, Telemachus. Perhaps Molly, the cheating wife of this figure of Ulysses, is herself the figure of Penelope, who was, how many of you read the Odyssey? There is one quality of Penelope that is considered the great quality of Penelope. She spent 10 years without her husband during a war, and then an additional 10 years uh, waiting for her husband to come home. In the last few years, while he was coming home, she heard no, nothing of him, thought he might have been dead. So for the final three years that he's gone, she has 110, 109 suitors trying to marry her because she is, well, she is beautiful and smart. She also owns quite a few nice piece of land and quite a few cattle. And so it'd be great to marry her. Um, but she does not lie with any of them. She stays chaste. Penelope is the great example of the anti-Helen who launches a thousand ships because of her infidelity. Or even Eve, who uh, launches uh, the, uh, the various Abrahamic fates from Eden into this disastrous and mortal world. And yet Penelope is chaste. Somehow, Molly, a known cheater, is a figure of Penelope. And you say, how do you know? She's a cheater. She talks about engaging in coitus with Boyle. She mentions parts of his anatomy that one does not mention in polite conversation. She left crumbs from him eating in Bloom's bed, in the bed, and also his indentation for when Bloom makes it home. And yet, in the final chapter of this book, chapter 18, we will hear from Molly in a sentence, or in a large sentence that only has two periods. Um, and that's sort of a joke because it has one grammatical period and it has one menstrual cycle and then we're in the course of it. Um, and I tell you this, I think you will find for all of that that she is justified in what it is that she has done. I say that as hypothesis three. Everything I have told you about everything that all these characters go through, that Molly, in, in the history of literature, particularly in the 18th century, 19th century, everywhere in Europe, whether it be Russia and Anna Karenina, France, um, and Madame Bovary, for a wife to cheat on a husband and to have it become known publicly is ruin. Often leads in death. I'll, I'll tell you. Without trying to spoil too much, the end of many 19th century novels that involve infidelity is suicide. Um, and so that is not how this work will end. So I'll tell you something, or I'll give you a question that may have a powerful answer. It's part of the power and universality of this text that it represents a shift in culture. It is one of the largest, if not largest, shifts that 
has occurred in the history of all humanity, which is an adjustment to the value and the expression of marriage. I think a lot of things have changed since the 1920s, now in the 2020s, right? But at this time, in the 1920s, uh, marriage, society, what was appropriate, what could be done, and, and the notion of being ruined were very different from what they are today. Okay. All right, so more about the life and times of James Joyce. It's good because I include a lot of what I want to say anyway. And I also have a picture of Garner. Okay, so 1905, it comes out with a work called Dubliners. During your Christmas break, I highly recommend that you read this work. There is a beautiful new 2500 a centennial edition of this text put out by Penguin, and the very last work called Death is a Christmas Story. Very interesting Christmas story by a genius that you will have read. Um, it was not published until 1914. 1916, he went to New York, uh, or sorry, it's published in New, uh, yes, in New York, uh, and, and then 1917, England, A Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man is published. It's very interesting. He is himself an English citizen. Ireland was subject to, to, to Britain at this time. Um, 1918, the first three chapters of Ulysses sent to the little review again. So, uh, like we've seen with Notes from the Underground and about Dickens, this is a work that was first serially uh, put together that it, it was published in sections. Why would a work be published in sections? I think I've asked this question, but it's an important question to ask. Think about it from a publishing angle and a sale angle. Why might you only put out a little bit at a time? And in fact, to see what, if people like it or not, it's like handing out samples. If people keep eating the samples, they're probably gonna want more. You know, this is Chick-fil-A logic, by the way. I was a sampler when I worked there. So we actually watched a video on that. And uh, in the video, there was this curmudgeonly guy who was like, I ain't giving away no samples. Uh, that's just giving away free money. And, uh, we were talking Chick-fil-A, so, well, in fact, if you give something away like this and somebody likes it, then they may come by. This is why, as a salesperson, you always put the clothes on so that they can see themselves. You need to create a future in which the person has the thing you're selling for them so that it seems right. If you want to go into sales, that's a powerful way to look at it, by the way. You need to tell stories. You need to, and there are different ways to sell, too. You know? Say, you seem like the kind of man that should have this sort of thing. Heals to one's vanity. Right? Or everyone has this. You the one who's not going to? Appeals to the generality. Yeah, in any case. So, uh, the first three chapters of Ulysses were sent to the Little Review and Avant Garde uh, periodical. Do any of you know what Avant Garde means? Anybody? It means the advanced guard. It means front runners. It means experimental, new. It's the opposite of, uh, of the back guard, uh, the operating guard, I guess we call it. Uh, Ulysses was received as a scandalous work. It involves infidelity, it shows a character defecate. It shows two characters share micturation with each other. They urinate next to each other after drinking. It shows Leopold Bloom in a Turkish bath watching himself uh, from the front as, as various hair follicles that cover his body rise and he considers them like a lotus. Um, it even has a moment where a dirty old man who's just been cheated on Looks at a young lame girl, doesn't know that she's lame, who commits an act of onanism. Uh, do any of you know who Onan from the Old Testament, Testament was or what onanism is? Onanism is a sophisticated word for uh, uh, self pleasuring oneself. Um, and so that is, all of that is in this book. You can see why it was considered scandalous and pornographic. In fact, there was a it required an act of the Supreme Court in the United States for it to be published here. An act of the Supreme Court, our highest appellate court, uh, in order to say this is not pornography. Um, and, and yet your professor in front of you keeps saying things like, greatest novel of all time. Uh, but this should also iterate to you what I said last time, which is when you see the thing as a seed, you don't necessarily know the tree it's going to become. Redwoods are small in the beginning, too. Redwoods from my home state. You know, they grow to be the grandest trees. 
But yes, uh, no, I include that. Sex, onanism, defecation, infidelity, drunkenness. Um, okay, very good. And so by age 50, Joyce had lost, okay, this is very important about him. He had lost all of the sight in his left arm. He's often represented like this. He only had 10% of sight left in his right eye. James Joyce, like Homer, like John Milton, who often the great English poet, writer of uh, of Paradise Lost through a man who wins, it says, which scribes, a fancy Latin name for scribe, joins the tradition of blind poets. This was not something that he welcomed. He did not think, oh, I'm joining Milton and Homer, the great two of the great epic poets. No, two of the three great epic poets. No, he, he hated the fact that he was going blind. And imagine being a reader and a writer who is going blind. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing worse. You can't write. You can't read. I mean, you can still hear. You can still dictate. But it was terrible. Um, oh, yes. And of course, in 1933, the United States versus one book named Ulysses is the name of the court case, uh, which lifted the ban on the work in America under uh, the, the reigning Judge John Woolsey at the time. Perhaps the most difficult work ever to have been written, The Book of the Night, this is called The Book of the Day, Finnegan's Wake is itself uh, follows Ulysses and is supposed to witness the dream life, potentially, of Leopold. So it is supposed to represent a dream. And if you can imagine how difficult a work is that represents a dream and how difficult it is to follow, it's amazing. I'll tell you one thing about the text. The first, Sentence of uh, of Finnegan's Wake is a continuation of the last sentence. In the book. <laughs> so you start in the middle at the beginning, which is also the end. Start in the middle of the sentence at the beginning of the book, which is the end of the sentence at the at oh, which is the beginning of the sentence at the end. It's all twisted together. Um. Okay. And then, uh, yes, uh, very sadly, uh, James Joyce at, in 1941 dies from an operation on perforated duodenal uh, uh, ulcer. That's a, a stomach, extremely painful, painful sort of ulcer to have stomach lining ulcer. Was, they tried to heal it, they failed to do so. Always so sort of sad when such epic thinkers die in such common ways. Okay, I've kept you a minute too long. I'm going to let you go and say a lot more to you.